Brazilian tapirs or lowland tapirs. They've got two names. And the one on the end over there is Tiago. He's nine years old. And the one next to him is Tiana. That's her birthday tomorrow, she'll be nine. And this one closest to me is Tito. He's a year and a half. And the little strokey one hasn't got a name yet and he's about six months now. But does anybody want to take a guess where you think Brazilian tapirs come from in the wild? Brazil? Yeah, that's right. I'm just making sure you guys are listening. <laughs> And they wouldn't actually live together out in South America like they do here at the zoo. They live a solitary life and then they come together to mate. And once the male's done his job, he clears up looking for another female and she's there pregnant. And some of you ladies might think nine months is long enough. How long do you think a tape is pregnant? Pardon? 18. Not that long. <laughs> 13 months. So just over a year. Does anybody know what you call a baby one? Apart from really cute. Pardon? No, they call a calf. And I think they look like a giant marrow when they're first born, because they're covering all those spots and stripes. But why do you think the babies have them and the adults are all brown? Hmm. Anyone? What do you think it helps them to do? So the difference. Yeah, that's right, help them camouflage. So when mum goes off the feed somewhere, her little one is hidden away in the grasses and bushes. So that little one really blends in. And after about eight months, they're fully weaned. So those spots and stripes start to fade away because they don't need them anymore. And having their spots and stripes when they're out walking around is going to um, make them stick out. So they fade and it helps that brown colour helps them to blend in with trunks and trees. But um, they're fully grown after about two years and they live up to about 15 to 20 if they're lucky enough in the wild. But in zoos, they tend to live 20 years plus because they've got free food. There's no need to hunt them and they've got private health care, so they're pretty well looked after. Has anybody been to the zoo over many years before? No? Well, our previous pair of tapirs, they both lived to a whopping 24, and in their lifetime they had 12 babies, and Tiana was their number 11. So I'm hoping that she's going to be here just as long, and have just as many babies, and she's already pregnant with calf number 5, and that's due around January, February time next year. But what do you guys think they're related to? What do you think they look like? And don't say your mother-in-law's. <laughs> a pig, yeah? Anybody else? Don't say it. What do you guys what do you see? She's an elephant. An elephant. So we've got elephant, pigs and walk hogs. Anything else? Hamster. Hamster. <laughs> A lot of people say anteaters as well as yeah. hippos, elephants and pigs. But they're actually related to horse, a rhino and a zebra. So a tapir came first. They've been on this planet unchanged for about 33 millions of years. And out in South America where they're from, out in that habitat, they didn't need to evolve anymore. But tapirs that live in different parts, they started to um, evolve until we got the horse, rhino and zebra. And they're all linked with their feet and they're called an ongulate, which is a fancy word for a hoof-stock animal with odd toes. And if you look at their feet, they do have four on the front and three on the back, but they've got a face and forward toe on each foot which supports their body. And where they come from is very marshy and boggy because they live near rivers and it helps um, them get a good grip so they don't slip over and also helps them to swim. And at the back there they have a pond and behind those trees we have another swamp and this dry up here acts like another swamp where now we get lots of rain. So they like it nice and wet and boggy. But a lot of people though think they're an anteater because of that nose. But they use that as a bit of a snorkel. And tapirs can't see very well. And if they think there's danger lurking around, they'll find the nearest river. They'll stick their bodies underneath and stretch their nose just out like that so they can breathe. And they can do that for a few hours um, until danger's gone and they can come back out. He just likes to be hand fed this one. He's spoiled too much. But I like to scatter their veg all around the paddock to stop them from being too lazy, they can go and look for it all. I'm just going to put it down here for a minute. Okay. But has anyone ever smelt tapir poo before? No. You don't really want to, trust me, it's very stinky. And if they did a lovely fresh one out in the jungle somewhere, it's going to stink and attract unwanted attention. So a jaguar is going to know there's a tapir close by. So how do you think they hold the evidence up? Mum would eat baby's poo for about six months, but they don't eat their own. He just wants the bananas now. <laughs> so 
So I'm going to toilet in a river to mask all that stinky smell. So it's really far for me to clean up their pond. It's my favourite job. But good job they do that though because they're nature gardeners. After all the berries and fruits and whatever else they've eaten, when they go to the toilet in that river, they disperse the seeds a lot more. And that eventually goes into vegetation for other animals to find shelter in and food. And auction for us guys to bring. So tapirs play a very important part of the ecosystem. Even on my compost heap, I get things that regrow and I can feed it back to them then. But the sort of food that we feed them on here, there's lots of horsey food, so all that cereal stuff is all horsey cereal, so cane nuts, flake barley's, alfalfa, and all that really good stuff there. And then this is lots of fruit and veg, and garlic and herbs and mushrooms and stuff, which, like I said, I like to scatter around the paddock, stop them from being too lazy. And they can eat wherever they want that grows in here. And we chuck lots of natural browse in, so lime leaves, willows, stinging nettles, all sorts of things like that. And they get plenty of hay in their house, but their favourite food is bananas, they've got very sweet cheeks. They've got those today as a treat. But in the world there, they, anything they come across, they're marsh plants, fungus, roots and shoots, you name it, they will try and eat. So watch your fingers if you keep them in here. But if you guys do have picnics up on the benches today, please could you take your rubbish home to recycle it. If you leave it laying around, birds and squirrels might pick it up or the wind blows. If it comes in here, obviously they will eat anything in order to eat in plastic. Well, there's actually four species of tapir in the world and three come from South America and one comes from Asia and the other three are all endangered and these ones are classed as vulnerable but the next stage for them will be endangered and that's because there's lots of habitats being lost, there's lots of main roads being built and tapirs come out at night time to feed when it's a bit cooler and they end up getting knocked over by um, lorries and things like that. But one of the characters that we support, they're putting reflectors out on the roads so when the headlights go on the reflectors, that dazzle the tapir's eyes and they run backwards into the jungle instead of across the road. So I hope that's going to save a few lives. And um, farmers, they shoot them because they eat their crops. And you're actually allowed to hunt tapirs in traditional ways. So how people have been doing it for thousands of years with bow and arrows and spears and stuff, but you're not allowed to use modern day technology. And unfortunately, people, poachers don't really care about the law and they shoot them and snare them anyway. But I do have a charity pot here. If anybody likes to put any um, donations in to help protect the tapirs in the wild, that would be brilliant. And in a few minutes' time, I'm going to scatter the food everywhere. Then I'm going to head over to the kangaroos and wallabies and feed them their favourite snack. But because obviously it's nice and sunny, they're probably far too busy sunbathing to care about any food. But I'll still do a little talk so you guys can learn a few things. And the next thing after that is down at the reptile house. There's an animal count with a little animal someone will bring up for you guys to meet and touch. Okay, but if you've got any questions about the tapirs, feel free to come and ask me. Hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you, okay? I'll just be standing over here if anybody wants to come up. Have you got any questions, guys? Have you got any questions? Thank you.